Welcome to part two of this short video series. We'll finish various elements to finalize a decked out laundry room while using some pretty remarkable tools and spray one heck of a top coat. So join me. I promise you'll learn a lot and it may even be a little fun. In part one, we learned how to build professional grade cabinet boxes and face frames in a strong effort to make this customer's laundry room feng shui and functional. First up is the shaker doors. Shaker is just a style referring to the square edges. The final width of the frames will be three inches, but cutting them about a quarter over will allow for straightening since maple tends to warp a lot like I mentioned in the last video. I previously milled this lumber to 13 sixteenths thick. That way, after final sanding, everything will be a solid three quarter. Marking off the rails and styles as I go helps keep everything organized and accounted for. Then I can join one edge straight and cut the width at the table saw. If you don't have a joiner, I suggest using this method that I showed in part one. You know, this guy thinks he has good taste, but that hat is quite distracting. Like, come on, man. Ugh, he's nice, and now I feel bad. Moving on. The doors have unique reveals on the face frames, based on what cabinet they're located and what side they reside. I start by marking each side reveal, then find the middle. Then it's as simple as measuring that distance. If no frame is available, it's helpful to lay it out on a scrap board. The styles are first to be cut. They are the full door height and don't require any special math. The rails, on the other hand, will need some computative analysis. Actually, it's a lot simpler than you'd think, as long as you know the tricks. For my rails, I have to subtract five and a quarter from the total width of that given door. How do I know that? I'll tell you, right now. First, you take the full width of the door, then subtract both frame widths, then add back both lengths of the tenons. It's as easy as one, two, three. I would follow up with a quick check that, indeed, you cut enough length for the tenons. And since you did that right, it's time to set the first router bit to the correct height. This is the grooving bit. Now, with the bearing even with the fence, I can run a test piece. The face side will always be down against the table. All of the rails and styles get milled through this bit, and using feather boards will help reduce inconsistencies. It's common practice to aim for the slowest RPM that still leaves you with a nice cut, but no burning. Now, the tenon bit can be matched to the same height as the test piece. Cut a tenon down a perfectly square piece of plywood. This will serve as a jig to hold the grooved side of the rail and eliminate tear out. I make sure to dial in the fit so sanding isn't a painstaking process. Before routing all of the tenons, Put all of the styles on the other side of the room and make sure you only have rails left or you will accidentally route tenons into the styles. Then your doors will look like this. I'm a bad boy. I've accidentally routed a few of the styles before and it's one of those mistakes where you just wanna say So here's only rails. Go slow, make sure the board is flat against the table and tight against the fence through the cut. An extra step that isn't necessary but makes your work top notch is this simple cleanup pass. It gets rid of the sharp jagged edges and has a better purpose that I'll tell you about in a minute. And don't forget to sand off the fuzzies so they don't interfere with the joint. I recommend a stop cut for the styles, dropping in a couple inches from the end and pulling up before you cut clear through. That way you won't get these voids. 
So since we did that right, we are rewarded with this nice shadow line and it decreases the chances that paint fills the corner like caulking. My bits from Rockler leave me with pretty snug joints so a dry fit is easier. You've probably seen this trick using two sticks and a clamp to measure the panel height. And it works pretty well, although much slower than this trick. Put the two tenons back to back, then measure to the nearest tenon while the other is flush with the end. Or even easier, just use that magical number again. The width is always simple, just measure the total length of the rail. With plywood, I tend to go just shy of these measurements. Solid wood will need an eighth inch of room for expansion and contraction along the width. Whoa. Whoopsies. One last dry fit will present any problems if the panel is too tight or cut too big. Stand there and be proud. Admire that you didn't cut those tenons in the styles, and we can all move forward without embarrassment. Two things I would recommend before gluing up is sanding the floating panels and inside edges of the frame. I've seen a few videos in the past on how to assemble a frame and panel door, or at least in what order. And from my experience, ending with the long style seems to be the easiest. Clamp with moderate pressure and watch for warping. A door that looks like this top door is not ideal. And as if I didn't have enough suggestions, I recommend you store the doors where they won't warp. This way, this time. The reason why I even own this drum sander is because sanding doors can be a task. A drum sander smooths over the joints, and anything that makes my products more consistent is worth investing in. This step isn't essential if you don't own one, but spending more time sanding with an orbital might be in your future. I like to show my mistakes, and this board was clearly not milled correctly by me. Fortunately, since this is paint grade, I can use Bondo for the repair. I left my doors a touch big so I can trim them back on the table saw. And there they are. Doors are a lot of work, and we still aren't done yet. So here's a quick clip for engagement. A puppy with hiccups and the sneezes. <laughs> I knew you'd like it, but you didn't have to like it more than my video. Sorry, he's a softie. Anyways, here you can see I'm choosing the least straight side of the door for the hinges to be on. The concealed hinges are commonly three to four inches from the end. One great way to make sure your hinges will work with the reveal you want is building a test setup. I'm shooting for a 3 16 reveal for most of the doors. There are several jigs on the market for this drilling process. I prefer the drill press though because it's very repeatable and consistent. Don't forget, longer doors may need a center hinge as well. The installation is pretty straightforward. I use a hinge as a guide to mark the hole position. A self-centering drill bit comes in handy here, but mine is packed in a box somewhere. Using a fairly undersized drill bit, I can pre-drill the holes to a specific depth, then drive the screws. With the door flipped inside out, I can reference where the hinges are located and transfer to the face frame. The one inch pocket hole screws work perfectly for mounting the doors. My goal is always to have a nice fit with minimal adjustments needed. So I mentioned that I was aiming for a 3 16 reveal for some of the doors. Well, there are a few doors that need a 3 quarter reveal, and I'll show you why. The current laundry room has baseboards that are taller than the existing toe kick. This door will need clearance to open. 
It looks best if the wall cabinet above matches, and the tall thin cabinet also needs clearance. I also designed the tower cabinet to be higher than the baseboard, so these doors and drawers will just have a 3 8 reveal for wall clearance. If you have time, it's worth testing the doors before you move forward. You know, this saw doesn't have enough power, and I need more capacity, so... Now that's what I'm talking about. More power. I finally decided it was best for my business if I purchased the best table saw on the market. This 52 inch capacity saw stop has a seven and a half horsepower motor, three phase, and a sliding crosscut table with flip down stops. And so far, I'm definitely enjoying my decision. I'm cutting drawer faces here, and I have to admit, the dust collection is pretty remarkable on this saw. That's even with my small dust collector because my Laguna isn't ducted yet. These will be the replacement drawer faces for the existing cabinet, as well as the coat hanger boards. Now for me personally, it's a lot easier to work on the drawers when the cabinet is off of the ground, which in this case is easier said than done. Don't tell my insurance. No woodworkers were harmed in the making of this video. Using silicone adhesive, since it sticks to pre-finished plywood, I pin nail riser supports to the back, then cut off the protruding pins on the rear side. These drawer slides have clips that engage the rear mount. Just make sure they're straight. Then start at the top by clamping a square to the frame, followed by a spacer block to keep the slide equidistant from the side. Then I just screw the front in first, then the rear mount. The second slide is as easy as the first. And a simple spacer block can serve as the square for the bottom. Quick and professional. It's most accurate to measure directly from the slides for the drawer box. When I need to add the sides to the measurement, I use the work pieces as the reference. Then I can rip and cross cut the box sides. These dual flip stops are incredibly useful because I can keep two active measurements at once and flip between the two. Box joints are my joinery of choice. Half inch seems to give me the least problems. Then a groove can be cut and the panels can be tailored. Boom, bang, pow. Sanding the insides now is for the responsible people. If you're a professional procrastinator, then you can pay the price and sand them later. If you haven't noticed yet, I'm using pre-finished quarter inch ply for the bottoms. You can really use whatever you can source. Making sure the box is square is just as important as getting the joints tight. If everything is all out of whack, chances are it won't fit well. The backs of the slides have a hook that engages in a pre-drilled hole on the box. You can see that here. Then the front clip can be mounted so the slide catches when it's slid in. Make sure the rear cutout is wide enough so it doesn't interfere with the mechanism. Now they can all be clipped in and finished with drawer faces. This back void will create problems, so we need to fill it. A simple way is to glue another panel of plywood to create a flush surface.
My drawer boxes are back set a touch, so a block of wood pushes them forward. The first face can be mounted with a 3 8 clearance on the right. A few temporary pin nails hold the position while I fit some clamps. Then carefully sized screws can be driven from the backside. The next face will be spaced 3 16 above the last. This specific spacing will repeat itself all the way up to the crown molding. And don't forget to break off the excess pin nails. The last step for this tower is to pre-cut the standoff for the crown. And there she is. We will breeze through the faux legs. A plywood template printed from SketchUp serves as a reference for now, so I can cut the individual aprons and the blocks that will be mounted for feet. My method of joinery is obviously dominoes, but you can use dowels or even epoxy. While the assembly is clamped up, I can attach the template using wood glue. I learned this trick and many more from Matthias Wandel's channel. Now it's as simple as cutting it out. You can use a jigsaw, a bandsaw, or even a handsaw. My table saw is just the safest tool in my shop, so it makes sense to use it when I can. My design calls for these two units to be mitered together. This is quite a thick cut to make in two inch stock, but this table saw doesn't seem to even notice. Mm, that is always nice. To prevent hurting the miters during finishing, I lightly super glue the cutoffs back on, then shave off the template on the joiner. These pieces will eventually have backings to them. We have a few awesome things to build before finishing, so here's another refresh. Meet Toby, my rambunctious little guy. This next component is going to be pretty fun to build because we are going to send a full bench top of dense ash through my planer, maxing out the 25 inch capacity at a full 1 8 depth of cut. This may explode my dust collector again. All inside of there is completely jam packed. The bench top will be a rough six foot length. So I bought two ash boards that were just over 12 feet. The easiest way to cut them in half is with the track saw. This will be more width than I need, so there is plenty of room for milling, which is the same steps that you've already seen. I'm aiming for a finished thickness of an inch and a half. Finding a nice orientation goes a long way. It's helpful if the growth rings are alternating as much as possible. This will help reduce future cupping. Now I'm marking which side should go in and out at the joiner. This will negate any differences in my fence not being perfectly 90 degrees. I teach you how to join boards just like this with a hand plane in my grand feature wall video. You may have noticed this other project behind me. Well, it's for an upcoming video. That's right, this channel has many projects. So subscribe so you don't miss them. Dominoes or biscuits will help keep things aligned. Using plenty of glue, I can clamp everything up and clean up the squeeze out. Once everything is dry, I can give everything one last scrape before shoving it into my Laguna Beast. Here we go. So I guess I was expecting chaos, but now I just realized that this planer was designed for this kind of thing and it didn't even hesitate. You know, trying new things is always an interesting process. So I guess what I'm saying is, he is right. Life 
is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And even with years of experience and countless hours of research, sometimes things go wrong. And in some cases like this one, sometimes they just go right. And I have a lot of people to thank, not just for the success of this simple benchtop, but for the creation of this business. You know who you are, and I couldn't have done it without you all. The pieces you see here will be supports under the bench on install day. Some last detail work includes adding pocket holes to the underside of the bench shelves, edge banding any plywood shelving that doesn't get a face frame, carefully pulling everything apart, adding last minute shelf pin holes, final sanding, filling any coarse grain, rounding over the front edges of the drawers and doors, which in my opinion looks a lot more elegant if it's only a partial round over like the one on the right. Then more detail sanding, adding hooks for the PSDR system that I use, and hanging everything up for spraying. And just like magic, a coat of primer appears. And these Envirolac products are the bomb diggity. It is an industrial coating with a catalyst, but it sprays extremely well through an airless and is truly comparable to the solvent systems that I've used. I mean, look how smooth it lays down. I go slow and light on intricate pieces and use water-based poly for the bench and drawers. When the hooks come off, I just fill them with a dab of putty and touch up the paint. Now the face frames can be glued on with silicone. Some three quarter inch pin nails will tack everything while the glue sets. Here's a visual aid so you can understand that you can only do this if you cut dados into your frames. Otherwise, I would rely on pocket holes and clamps. It's finally time to wrap everything in moving blankets before loading up. Lately, I've been trying out different kinds and sizes of trucks and trailers so I can decide what fits my business best when the time comes to purchase one. With some help, we bring the large units inside. Straight away, I can begin installing the toe kick for the tall, thin cabinet. A cutout has to be made in the cabinet itself to accommodate the dryer vent on the wall. Then it can be tilted upright and lifted onto the pedestal. If you remember in part one, there is extra face frame on the wall sides of these cabinets that can be cut and tailored to the wall which in the event that we didn't have this, we would have to add some sort of filler piece to contour to the wall. In my case, I have just enough to be able to scribe to the wall, then slide the cabinet out and cut with a jigsaw and multi-tool. Now the cabinet sits plumb and the small gaps are culkable. I drill holes and insert wall anchors using a right angle attachment. Then the face frame can be screwed to the wall and the back to the rear wall. The access port gets a removable top connected with screws that are meant to be obvious. Now the wall cabinet can be temporarily installed to get a proper measurement. The clothes hanger is cut in many different ways to fit properly. The wall cabinet can be taken back down to avoid any mishaps and the coat hanger can be raised up onto a temporary mounting cleat then screwed to the wall. It's clearly much easier to slide the wall cabinet into place last. And everything fits. Like a in my case, there is a vent in the ceiling, so I installed a diffuser. The main tower is installed the exact same way. Then the faux legs can be cut to fit the correct height and the backings can be glued and pinned on. Screws hold the aprons to the frame and box.
A touch of caulking finalizes the miter, and I can move on to the crown. The standoff is mounted, you guessed it, 3 16 above the doors. Then the crown is glued and pinned in place. Moving on to the bench, each T is screwed together then attached to the main assembly. In sequence, I can make sure I'm remaining level and cut the uprights if need be. The last section gets tailored to the angled wall. Then a piece of cardboard is set for their final bench top. Okay, I'm kidding, it's a template. And what do you know? It fits like a glove, we know. I almost forget to add the cleats to the back wall and the baseboard underneath. Some pre-drilled holes will be used with finished screws and the frames can be added. Now the real bench top can be placed and some screws can be driven in various locations. These top side screws will be hidden by the nook. which can be slid into place and mounted to the wall and bench top. The coat hangers are just glued and pin nailed to the wall. There really aren't many studs to utilize here. My emblem can be mortised into the tower door The existing cabinet can receive its replacement doors and drawer faces. The two tall doors can be connected as one and various hardware is installed, caulking, and paint touch-ups. Well, you made it. Most of you made it. Thank you. And it's time for final shots. Subscribe here and you can watch this video next.